Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Everybody, my name is Debbie Horovich, and um, I will introduce you to my guest Shane Gray in just a sec. In just a second. Um, I want to welcome you to the Silver Lining Storycast. This is the new interview storytelling series that I'm launching this fall. And um, I created it as a result of creating the Silver Lining Storybook, which is uh, the storytelling book that I published. And I really wanted an opportunity, more opportunities to give to the amazing people that I know to share their Silver Lining stories, not just in a book, not just on that schedule, um, so the Silver Lining Storycast is here, and um, we're going to be launching uh, through the fall and sharing Silver Lining stories, not only from Toronto, but around the world um, with you. My guest today, oh, and really what we're doing in these conversations um, is we're exploring, uh, you know, the value in difficult times in life. Um, and very often the stories that people are sharing on the Silver Lining Storycast and in the Silver Lining Storybook and in articles, they're sharing them with me for the very first time. Um, so it's very special for everyone in the audience to be listening to this exploration of value, where we see value in the difficult times that we have, and really discovering and proving that every storm cloud has a silver lining. So I'm really excited today. My guest is Shane Gray. He helps creatives and creative businesses to produce commercial promo and photo, uh, photo and video content. In the case of artists and businesses who are just getting started or still growing, what he does is he helps his clients get to that next level with their marketing uh, materials. So uh, Shane, welcome. I'm Thank so you. glad to have you here today. Thanks for having me. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just start with um, talking a little bit about your business and give you an introduction sure. or introduce you to the audience. Okay. Um, so what I'd like to find out first is about Shane Gray Photography, about your business. Um, if you can tell me about your business and who are the people that you serve. Sure. Um, so you kind of wrapped it up nicely there at the <laughs> beginning, but um, the kind of medium version is... They're basically two different, um, they're kind of two different markets, but they're actually sort of the same. So on the one hand, there are lots of businesses in the city. So I do a lot of commercial material for them if they've got a new product or a new service or a new something that they need a little bit of help with. Um, I do the promo photography for that. Uh, so advertising campaigns, sometimes it's like um, TV studios and things like that. There's new hosts. Now they all need new headshots and new promo material or they're launching a new show and they need an image to be able to promote that. Um, so I do that. But the other part of it too is that Toronto in particular is a hotbed of artists. And I think for me visually, some of the artists here that are really doing really interesting things are, uh, some of them are just at such a great, um, such a great level in their career. And there's such diversity that I think for me it makes my job that much easier. <laughs> so um, some of them, they can be musicians, sometimes they're performers. There's a puppeteer, for example, that I worked with who did a lot of work with Jim Henson oh. on like the Muppets and, and, uh, My favorite. yeah, right. The Muppets <laughs> and Sesame Street and all that sort of stuff. But he also did all these Chucky movies and things like that. Like he's in the puppeteer world. He's a big deal. Yeah. So he came to me in this, basically this, this Tim Burton-esque fat suit that he had made for himself and wanted me to shoot it. Basically what the situation is, he's got this puppet show, which is for adults, not for kids so much. It's a little colorful, there's some colorful language and stuff <laughs> like that in there, but it's hilarious. And uh, the guy's name is Frank Meshkalite, and the show is my big fat puppet show. So I did the promo material for him, and basically the idea is he's got this suit that he's created for himself. He's a super tall, thin guy. And in the middle of the show, he busts open the costume and there's a whole stage inside. It's hardwood with lighting, and the whole puppet show happens inside. Wow! So that kind of community that I also have access to is very interesting. So to promote his puppet show, for example, uh, we did all of that promo as well. And so I, I feel like for guys like that, as long as I've got the camera pointed in the right direction with the lens cap off, probably going to get something pretty good even without 
yeah. doing a whole lot. So yeah, it sounds like there's n um, not a lot of boring photo shoots with the artistic community. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. Not every single shoot is a dream job necessarily, but the people are interesting enough and we can usually pull something interesting out of it. I mean, mm. that's, that's always the challenge, right? Yeah. Well, I think, I think a big part of it is what you're doing is you're, you're really working with people's vision for themselves. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's not even necessarily a vision that they have in reality at the moment, but yeah. you're trying to project that. And one of those things actually to that point is <laughs> one of the greatest compliments I ever got, which was in this space right here was somebody came to me and I, I had the conversation of how did you find me? And so it was basically a Facebook referral. And he said, you know, I had this list of photographers, but I didn't really know that I wanted that until I saw the stuff that you do. And so I thought, that's the greatest compliment, of course, that I could get. Right? Yeah, being chosen by your work. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And to me, that's obviously a big deal is somebody chooses me for me, not just some guy who's going to push the button, right? Because yeah. there are tons of those in the city, and that's great. And it's not about the price necessarily. That's it's right. It's about the creative that's right. that you bring to it. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. It makes me feel so much more like... I'm, I, now I can see myself even um, with my fairy godmother brand. Yeah. <laughs> I can see working with you to bring that visually let's to life. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. It gives me a really good feel for, you know, how you work in your business because there's a lot of photographers yep. in the city and everywhere. Yep. And um, to, to become distinctive for your work yeah. um, and stand out in that way is, yeah. is really valuable. But, you know, another point to that, though, is, of course, as much as a client is qualifying us, hopefully, before they buy, uh, we're also qualifying those people as well sometimes, right? Our, our own clients. So I often tell people, and it sounds like it could even be a bit of a gimmicky thing, but when I know that there are other photographers that are bidding on the same job, I often tell people, especially if it's something that's really personal that they've worked on, a new album or something like that, if it's a musician, then I tell them, you know what? There is really a sea of really great talent in the city. So if you find somebody else that's a better fit for your vision, you should absolutely go with that person. Yeah. Even though for me, I'm not going to get that necessarily, right? I mean, but people often feel like, I think that the side benefit to that is that people feel like, oh, I really trust this guy. First of all, he's not coming from a place of desperation. Yeah. Second of all, he appears to actually care about how the project comes out, right? And if it does wind up going to somebody else, then I'm going to genuinely look forward to seeing how it turns out in the end. Of course. We've got a, an interesting relationship together. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I, I think that there's, there is no, there's no harm. There's no negative in being honest and, yep. and, and looking at the, I mean, especially when you work in client, in creative services, yeah. you're, you're offering a personal service yeah. that is very personal yeah. and very intimate. Um, yeah. and, and, um, extremely like, I don't think there's anything more subjective in the world than a picture of yourself. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> right? I, I don't think we could be more critical of anything. Yeah. Um, so you, you put yourself in a professional position that, um, that, that you know, opens you up to that, um, sure. you know, that feeling of insecurity perhaps or does it fit <laughs> or how do I make business happen? Yeah. Um, and when you really look at it as the outcome, the, the best outcome for the person, ultimately, whether they work with you or not, yeah. that's the way to, yeah. um, you know, yeah. to establish a strong relationship. Yeah. They can refer other people to yeah. you, you know, even just for your style. Yeah. Yeah. And a couple of things to that point as well is that uh, sometimes the job is very much uh, a job that deals a lot with psychology. Like you said, like trying to take a picture of somebody. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of psychology that comes through. What I see is not the same thing as that person sees when we're looking at exactly the same photograph, right? I think it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And some people necessarily don't. Yeah. Um, so, for example, there's a super quick uh, story is that I've got a proofing gallery. Uh, not a proofing gallery. Um, a sample headshot gallery. So when the inquiry comes in, look, I just need a really simple headshot. I don't need anything overly creative then I just send them this, this hidden link and mm -hmm. it just gives them a sense of, okay, these are different looks. They're all done by me. So I know how they were done. We could whip that off relatively easily. Um, so a woman came in, as soon as she came in, she seemed very powerful and very assertive and 
just a really nice balance of of confidence and also just humanity. And she's very warm. So it was great, right? I'm thinking that's exactly what I want to show in these photographs. And if she wants to promote herself, she had just left some job that she didn't love. She wanted to go do something else, which was another thing. It's like, congratulations. It's like, oh, everybody else is like, oh my God. But uh, it's that's scary a, to make that yeah, transition. Course, that's course, the best but, transition ever. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, so we're taking some photos and I shoot so that it comes up on a computer screen so we're not looking at you know, the back of the camera. <laughs> so I'm looking at these photos and I'm saying, wow, these look fantastic. And she looks at them and says, all the people in that headshot gallery looked so strong and confident. And I thought I was going to look like that too. And I, my heart just melted for this woman because I'm looking at these. I know that she looks very assertive and just very positively confident and very approachable. Mm -hmm. But she just didn't see any of that. So mm -hmm. anyway, so that's an opportunity then to, okay, what do we need to do? We need to massage this until the client is happy. But for me, that was just a very defining moment of we're looking at this thing here. And this person sees something very like drastically different than I do or than anyone else would, so that there's that whole thing of self-image and all that stuff that we could spend the whole day talking about. <laughs> that is definitely a huge part of the job, for sure. Yeah, it's. It, I think it's a really big realization, yeah. I think, for you as a professional. Yeah. Even. Um, Navigating all that. How, how long have you been a photographer? Uh, it's it's kind of hard to say, only because it was sort of in the family for a long time, so I kind of was always sort of with it to varying degrees, but got serious about it much later. Because I guess I was there for a while and then went away from it, did other things, I actually studied music, mm. uh, and then came back to it. But um, I've been doing it professionally for maybe the last six years or so. And so what I'm wondering is at what point do you think you made that realization the the, the situation with this woman, you know, happened, but... It takes a while to really come to that realization of yeah. how how much impact you have on your clients and how much really responsibility you have for the mm -hmm. successful outcome. Right, right, yeah. Sure. <laughs> Just by in how you treat and approach your clients. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there, there's that whole dynamic of how do we work together and can I make this person feel confident enough that... Because really what I'm looking for, especially I had a situation, another situation, I was working with a larger team, a makeup artist, PR agent was sitting there. So the client was four hours late. And so the PR agent was the contact person mm. for the talent who was coming, who was also the client. And so the, uh, the PR agent ha is, is a beautiful human being. She's so wonderful, but um, she's also got a bit of a short fuse sometimes, which is also great because she's just a very direct tell it like it is kind of a person, which I very much respect. And sometimes I'm, I'm the one who sort of, I soften all the edges and sort of, you know, everything is great and all that sort of stuff. But she's very, she'll just get in there and just say what needs to be said, which is great. Um, <laughs> but I could see this fuse kind of boiling short as we're all sitting around. And she eventually said, I just got to call this woman and ask her like, what the hell? Like, WTF, man? What, why is she so late? And so that was kind of the point, too, where I'm like, well, we need to make sure that she feels a certain way when she comes. Because yeah. if we're all on her case about being so late, which obviously she shouldn't, yeah, then the photos are going to look mm. terrible. So somehow I need to twist this situation to still make her feel like she's already going to feel bad about coming four hours late. So... What I need to do in order to get the photo is to put her in that position where she feels relaxed, like it's no problem. We can give her hell afterwards, uh, that's fine. But at, at the time that, the whole thing is of course you have to find that something to get the best possible performance out of the person that you're shooting, whether it's a photo or a video or whatever that is. Yeah, I guess for their own benefit. Totally, yeah, yeah. yeah and for <laughs> mine, right? they want, If yeah. they look good, then obviously I of look course. good and I'm happy to promote that. If it doesn't look good, that person can't use it, and it's no good for me either. Right. So, okay, awesome. I think I know a lot more about you. Great. Right. <laughs> good start. Now, you've got some really good silver lining stories that you've realized that you can share with us. So why don't you share? Sure. sure. <laughs> Tell us what you've been thinking about. Um, well, I mean, there, there's so many. When we started to have these conversations about silver, silver linings, of course, there are all over the place, which is in itself, I think, 
a great springboard to learn all kinds of things, right? Out of the negative, we try to find a positive. Um, but having said that, if there's an overarching theme, I think it's a really common thing where creatives in particular are working a job necessarily that they don't want to do. And they want to do that thing that they feel passionate about, that actually is fun to do, that they feel is a valuable way to spend the hours that we all have here, rather than cashing them in for something that we don't necessarily want to do. And so for me, I think it was just sort of making that transition. How do I actually make that work? Um, and so the how that all came to be, I think, is sort of the, the silver lining thing where I'm in a job I don't want to do, and then I sort of translate uh, what I want to do into a paycheck, mm -hmm. uh, which I think that's a really common thing. So I thought... I think so. Yeah, it's such yeah. A, it is such a struggle, and I yeah. know for me it was incredible incredibly painful and incredibly difficult. Yeah, so I'm glad yeah. you will share your story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but even within that framework, there are tons of little silver lining stories. I think the most hilarious one is... <laughs> so there's there's another... Uh, I don't even know if this is the right time to pull this out, but there it turns out there's another Shane Gray out there. So oh, yeah. <laughs> the spelling of my name, do you know this one already? Did it, I tell you this? You, you okay. gave me a little preview, but I did, yeah, yeah, okay, tell the okay, audience. Great. It's a good so, one. <laughs> Yeah, so of course, as we're trying to establish ourselves as a creative, uh, luckily I don't have the name Bob Smith or anything because there are who knows how many hundreds of thousands of those. So I thought before I Googled myself that I had pretty good cards with Shane Gray, spelled S-H-A-Y-N-E-G-R-A-Y. So the Y in the Shane has always caused me problems with my birth certificate, passports, uh, getting my driver's license. Nobody ever spells it right. But I thought that at least that would translate into uniqueness online. Which is great, except that it turns out there's a soft gay porn star out there, also with the exact same spelling, so which I got fan mail for also one day wow. via Facebook. Um, oh, yeah, thanks. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So this guy reached out and said, "Oh my God, oh, are no. you the Shane Gray?" I'm kind of thinking, "Oh well, well yeah, of course, I, yeah, Shane definitely. Gray, yeah, yeah, I must be the Shane Gray." <laughs> so he's like, "Oh man, I love your movies," and then it sort of clicked. Well, wait a minute now, uh, I don't know that I have any movies out there. And so, anyway, he said, I don't think you're the same one. And by the way, have you seen this film? And I said, oh, yeah, right, no. But I'm aware that oh, there's this other Shane Gray that's out there. Um, so that's kind of one of those things. I think in the meantime, I rank this person on Google. But still, it's, it's kind of a funny sort of thing. And <laughs> yeah. So I, I could change my name or I could just own the whole... <laughs> as long as people don't confuse us, then... Yeah, like, and, okay. and I mean somewhere at some point there could be a realization that it actually having another person with the name that is creating some level of awareness for the name. Yep. Like the, the saying of there's no, uh, all publicity is good, good publicity, publicity right. right? Even if it's bad publicity, yeah. it's still good for you. Yeah. Um, and I've experienced that. I've had bad publicity that still benefits me. Sure. Sure. That I'm happy to say, yes, I was featured in this mass media right. because nobody ever looks at it and sees right. that it wasn't really that great. Right, right. Um, so, I, yeah, that's a great silver lining. I mean, it's kind of one of those <laughs> funny things. And, and the other thing to that is eventually I, was, I hadn't transitioned fully into full-time full -time photographer yet. I remember also going to a job interview and sort of scoping out the room. And then the question came, is there anything else you want to tell us? And I sort of thought, mm, it's kind of maybe a bit risky to just bust this out. But... I also thought in the day of, in the age of Google, as soon as I leave the room, they're going to oh, Google yeah. me. So anyway, right. is anything else you want to tell us? I was like, yes, I'm not a soft gay porn star. And it was kind of that <laughs> moment of, there's like record scratch in the room, music stops, everybody like, <laughs> they're like, what? And so then I, I told them, yeah, exactly. And so when I told them, okay, look, you're probably going to Google me, there's this. And so they laughed hysterically and I don't know if it was... Hopefully not Did just because of that, I got the job. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, I don't know if there's a silver lining in itself, I guess. And it, was a, it was a pretty good job, so I can't complain. That's, yeah, <laughs> well, th then there you go. That That is a definitely a clear silver lining yeah. to having a soft gay porn star, having the exact same name as you, <laughs> yeah. is that it gives you something funny to say, right, right. entertaining, to connect you like you're just human. Yeah. These yeah, things happen sure, to people, sure. and, and it sort of removes all of that fear of like, uh, you know, like, of course, you don't go to a job interview where you don't want the job. 
Right. Right. And so there's a lot of feeling of like fear of rejection. Yeah. And I hope they're really going to pick me because right. this job could change my life. Like right. if you're going from having no job yeah. to having a job, yeah. it will change everything yeah, for you. And you really want them to yeah. pick you. Yeah, yeah. But when you when you show up really authentically and yourself and you say, listen, here's the situation. Yeah. I've got a soft gay porn, <laughs> a soft porn star um, that does that has my exact same name. It, I mean, exactly. You know, then, then, then it's the, okay. You're human, and now they can only judge you by your work. That's right. That's right. And the other thing, I guess, is that to the point even about us qualifying other clients, mm -hmm. and in this point, uh, I mean, at, at that stage as well, any job that we want, assumably, if we apply for that job, we actually want the job. So I had already pre-qualified them. But I think even on a personal level, it was sort of an opportunity to show some personality. So I, I just framed it like, bam, right? <laughs> like, not a soft gay porn star. And they were like, where is the relevance in that? And so it was just a funny way to yeah. also sort of, and you know, I mean, if had they been so staunch and been like, all right, get out of here, then it would have been clear to me in that moment that we wouldn't have been a good fit. Exactly. And it would have actually that, saved me time. A, that's a right? great silver lining yeah, right sure. in there is, sure. is knowing this is not going to be a fit yeah. Yeah. and we can leave with a laugh. That's right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> but they liked it. They, they got a good laugh out of my, at my expense, which I'm also fine with that. I love to just have fun and be a little bit ridiculous. Like I can be serious when I need to be, but it's kind of, if we can sort of be our authentic self and have fun at the things that we're doing, then, then we're doing something right. Well, and I think that that almost like, you know, it relates back to silver linings. Yeah. I see them everywhere. Yeah. If you can just not take life so seriously, mm -hmm. if you can sometimes laugh, if you can see the positive in the negative, yeah. um, that in itself is a growth of a human being, For a sure. human being growing and being able to take on more opportunities or um, embrace their potential in this life so much more yeah. than we, any of yeah. us do. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, so few of us are yeah. reaching anywhere near our potential, right? right? We've right. got so much more to do every yeah. day. So tell me more about some of the silver lining stories that you've discovered. Sure. Um, <laughs> I know you've got more. <laughs> <laughs> so basically the whole thing was trying to get from a place where I'm at my job, which, it, don't get me wrong, it was a great job. I was a director of a company that was very international. Um, so there were, there were a lot of benefits, actually, full benefits. Um, <laughs> Ninth benefit. story office, bamboo floors, floor to ceiling, windows, view of the CN Tower and the lake and all that sort Makes of stuff. you feel important to go to a job like that. I felt right? great mm -hmm. actually doing the job. The only problem with the job was that it was all consuming, where I... I was sometimes working 10, 12, 14 hour days at its busiest. And so that leaves obviously exactly zero room to do anything else that we need to do to feed our souls. And so as a creative, that was not what I was looking for, of course. I needed some, because initially really the whole thing was, I was doing photography, I had zero the idea was not to necessarily make photography into a paycheck. I was fine to just like goof around with it and kind of have fun and just create because we should always all be creating whatever it is that we do. Uh, and it was fine to take it there. But eventually, as I started to put things online, then people started to ask, hey, I got this thing. How much would you charge to X, Y, Z? And so that is basically how it started and how I was then trying to navigate those two things. I've got this job that I do and it's very secure. And then I've also got this thing that I'm also trying to do just because I like it. And because I'm trying to use these hours that I have in my life, like we all do, to do something that's fun, rewarding, and somehow relevant to my existence. Can I ask a couple questions yeah, of course. about that period? So you were working a full-time job and trying to explore your passion at the same time. How did you discuss or talk about your passions when you're at work, when you're socializing with your peers, with your bosses, with people who report to you? How, how did you sort of reconcile your two existences? Well, uh, and at that time, I mean, you might not have done it very well, right, but what right, was the situation right. for you at that time? Um, well, it's complicated because there's so many different parts to that. Uh, but 
One of them was because we're increasingly more and more connected on social media, a lot of my uh, coworkers and bosses and things like that, even we're connected on Facebook or whatever, so they see all the things that I'm doing. And eventually, so I got a lot of praise and a lot of people are photographers, right? Everybody's got access to really, really great equipment now, which is fantastic. And I also think that mm -hmm. that keeps pressure on the top people to... It totally does. Because for people just to Continue say, getting better. right, so for people just to say, look, there's this huge influx, this mass of people that are coming in that call themselves photographers, and that's, that's another issue that we could spend a lot of time on. But uh, one of the things to that is that I think it really does really promote a very pure level of creativity and also puts pressure on us, which I think is a good place to be. Mm -hmm. If we're too comfortable, we're probably not doing it right. Right. Yeah. So you're definitely losing ground. If yeah. You get too yeah. So there's there's something to that that I think is kind of nice. But so there were other people that were also sort of like hobby amateur photographers that also just did that for fun. Mm -hmm. um, but people even in the workplace started to take note, and it I almost kind of felt like I could sort of fuse the two because my bosses then started to ask, "Hey, well, can you come in and do these?" photography or video related things mm. and so I kind of had this mixed feeling of being used a little bit right because I'm not going to pay extra for that yeah, no, 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 of no. course and I mean of course they would want to hire exactly, me for yeah, their photography yeah. and save a thousand bucks yeah, off a professional yeah. photographer yeah and there was there, was, there wasn't <laughs> anything even to do with payment for overtime hours worked at the regular job anyway it's all for the exposure yeah, so that, you're right. So, yeah, as, as creatives, we can die from exposure is the same, but, uh, yeah. Die from exposure, yeah. right? That's so funny. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, so there was that where I could also even use some of those hours where I was at work to even just sort of have fun with photography a little bit. Mm. Um, what, what was your job? So I was actually director at a language school, and I've, I've lived in, in Europe, uh, in a couple of different places, so uh, it was a really interesting time to also explore learning languages myself, uh, which I also discovered that I quite like, actually. <laughs> I don't mind being in, put in a position where I look like I talk like a two-year-old for a little while, because the outcome of that is, with enough practice, then you've got access to all of these super culturally rich experiences mm -hmm. that you otherwise don't have. And for me, that was a very important part of my time in, in Europe. Yeah, I think um, it sounds, uh, and I, I feel a lot of the same way, like I know that if I dive into something, if I completely yeah. immerse myself mm -hmm. in it, it's extremely uncomfortable sure. at the beginning, yeah. but you've got this rapid growth and rapid learning yeah. phase that is so valuable, and, yeah. and you just can't replace it in any yeah. other way. You can't. There's no other way to yeah. to have that experience. That's exactly the thing. If we're not taking risks, if we're feeling too comfortable, we're definitely not doing it right. <laughs> so I think that that's a big deal to me. Okay, so now I want to ask you another job, uh, yeah. another question. Um, because I think that transition period is where a lot of people really stumble. Yeah. Right? And so you've been through it. So yeah. the question I have, so we talked about sort of how you managed to navigate talking about yeah. your passions with the people that you work with. And yeah. that was a place where I really stumbled and, and felt a lot of um, sort of... Um, jealousy almost you know like we were all competing at the ad agency for the same promotions right. working on individual each our own clients yeah. um, but all competing to be the next one that gets noticed at right. that level right. and so when I'm coming back from the weekend and saying oh yeah I did a live stream on Forbes this weekend my peers are like who the hell does she think she is right I drank this weekend. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, so that's, that's a, one thing that's difficult, but another phase that's really difficult that a lot of people really don't know when to make that, that big massive commitment yeah. is getting space. Right. Not, not necessarily going full time because going full time on your own is very easy. You can always just go get a job. Right. Worst case scenario. I mean, people believe you can just go get a job. Right. I know that's not really true. Right, right. Yeah, there's <laughs> spent, a big asterisk there. I spent there. years job hunting, yeah. overqualified, could not get a job at Tim Hortons, could right. not get a job under my, you know, like I'm like a CEO. And yeah. so if you're hiring me for anything less, I'm overqualified. Right, right. <laughs> so 
What I want to ask about is we're here in your studio in this great space. That's a massive commitment. When you were making that transition from full-time to full-time employee, and, and it's really a mindset change yeah. that happens, yeah. full-time employee to really on your own in this world and exploring what you can do and where you can be of service and how you can really fulfill your potential. Yeah. Did you have any sort of missteps around making a big commitment to a space or, or concerns or like nights left, you know, with no sleep? <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, imagine, right. You're working a 14 hour day and, and if you've got other commitments beyond that and plus then if you're, doing it right, then you should also sleep there somewhere and eat and maybe even shower once in a while. Uh, so there's all that stuff. But yeah, I mean, of course, I didn't start with a studio. I started with the basics. I started with what I had. And it's really easy to get obsessive with the gear and with the toys because they're all sparkly. The ads are very good at targeting us to really make our mouths water. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, there's that drive to want to just get gear. If I get that one piece of gear... Uh, it's going to help me and I'm going to be a better artist where, you know, if you, you can look at some of the other people who are just producing content out there and see specifically attached to any photo, sometimes there's the information attached to that, which mm -hmm. shows what kind of camera they're using, what lens was used, what all the settings are, if there was a flash attached, if it fired, all that stuff. So some of that was a really great learning experience too, because I'd sort of see out of like Midwest states there somewhere, 14 year old girl with like a very intro level prosumer camera with the kit lens on it. It's doing something absolutely amazing where I look at it and I think I oh, will never be able to do that. Wow. And then I look at it and I see, well, wait a minute, this is like lesser gear than I actually already have. So that is also, I think one of those things that puts us under pressure, right? Absolutely. We look at all these people that are out there doing amazing things and it's obviously not the gear. So that, that's one of the things, right? I, I don't think it is obvious yeah, at all. I, yeah. think, I think it's the opposite of obvious. I, I, you know, like, and, and I've worked in advertising my entire career. I'm obsessed with media, so I can't say that it's evil. Yeah. But it certainly works to make us feel like if we purchase something, yeah. we'll be more loved, we'll right. be more accepted, we'll be more successful. Right. It's As a magic a bullet. It, some, is, right? it is. And yeah. I remember, um, you know, in my 20s when I was dating and had this dream of I want to find a man and get married, yeah. that I would walk into Shoppers Drug Mart and spend 50 or $60 in the makeup aisle, mm. feeling coming out of there like now when I put this on my face, I'll be more loved. Right. With, you know, which yeah, is so sad. That's super it's sad. so sad yeah, that, I, that I had that yeah. sense of the world. Yeah. Um, and thankfully, I don't have that anymore. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Spending money Coming and things. That. Yeah, now life is much more about experiences. And, and money is incredibly important. And we have to be able to support ourselves yeah. and pay our bills and, and do good in the world sure. with the money that we earn yeah. and with the money that we give away mm -hmm. and where we spend it is yeah. critically important. Yeah. Um, and to that, I think the way that we spend money can either, you know, help us or hurt us. Mm -hmm. And and it's a crutch for a lot of people. It's, it's like a drug. It's like gambling or drinking yeah. where you feel like, oh, okay, if I spend this, you get that high from spending it. Um, and I think that that's a really a serious trap that can yeah. happen, especially with photographers, yeah. um, especially with people like makeup artists. You yeah. know, they have if you have to invest in so much gear yeah. to make that transition. And it wasn't like you had that gear at your job. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so I had <laughs> you weren't working for, as right? a photographer. You had to actually get yeah, all yeah, of just it. out of out of fun money that I had. I had to, of course, just just buy that just because wow. I wanted to. And the other thing to that, I think, is that a lot of people because it it can be like to go from zero to a hundred is a big investment, right? But I mean, you can slowly start to acquire things that you really feel like you need because they're tools. We're artists, right? It's it's a it's a pencil that we're basically using to. Yeah create whatever it is that we want. So that gear is not going to make us better artists, but it should help us to whatever that thing is that we want to achieve that that tool is going to actually do for us. So a lot of people also it's still might just even, a tool. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but the issue behind that though is even contemplating how much do I spend reasonably 
at one moment. Yeah. Because we don't necessarily so. want to go into debt and drive ourselves into the ground before we've even Which uh, reached the Which is what a lot line. of people do. That's, yeah. I mean, a lot of people view, um, and, and the standard business, how business is looked at is, is you get revenue coming in and then you've got expenses that come out first. Right. Yeah, of course. Of <laughs> right. Course. The first thing you do when you launch a business is you start spending your money. Yeah. And it's it's kind of a backwards view at, at looking at it's it. All front and it's and really, loaded. it's it's very dangerous, I mm -hmm. think, for people who are coming from a job because you don't have to go out and hunt for every meal before you can eat it when you're at a job your work is served to you. Yeah. The expectations are, are very, you know, within a box. You don't have to really stretch on yeah. a daily basis. Yeah. And that's what jobs are great at, right. at, at giving you a very, you know, steady income yeah. and expectations that everyone can rely on. Yeah. And it's a very sort of, yeah vanilla life that's right that's right and that's that kind of brings me back to the point that you were even trying to make is is just that transition anyway um there are a lot of different ways to get there of course but again with the theme of not just going directly from zero to 100 but trying to get there a little bit slowly uh, i think i probably did it absolutely wrong like textbook wrong uh gary vanerchuk for example <laughs> says that he's got a lot of advice i think People ask specifically a guy like Gary Vanderchuk a lot, how do I turn this passion that I've got into a full-time job? And I think his answer is something like, you know, don't just leave your job and do that thing, right? That's a huge mistake. Yeah. It's going to fail, blah, 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 right? Uh, instead, get like, um, which is actually kind of a good idea, he says to uh, get like a night watch security kind of a thing, right? People, can, you can read a book or you can, with all of those hours, work on your business and yeah. you're still getting paid, right? Yeah. So whatever that idea is, you can you can work on that already yeah. on the clock. Uh, so if you're I not in your passion already, exactly. turn your working hours into a job where you've got the opportunity to explore that's other right. things at the same so time. So that's a brilliant idea. It Unfortunately, really I'm not so brilliant. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that smart. So... What I did was I had my job where I was working way too many hours and had zero time to actually do any of it. I knew that there were a bunch of steps that I needed to take, but I just didn't have the time to actually take those steps. So I, I did that thing that you're not supposed to do. At a certain point, uh, there were jobs that were coming in that I had to decline, and I saw that my job was standing in the way. So I got a call one day from some friends of mine some acquaintances, and they had also just through social media, which is the, the power of social media these days. If you're just kind of messing around with something and some people identify with it, that's a great starting point right there. But anyway, so this woman works for a really huge, big brand name, and I thought, I want to do commercial photography. I need to take that job. And so since I was a director, I could sort of sneak out when I wanted to, and I didn't need to ask anybody. I was just say, okay, see you later. My yeah. boss was also in, in England, right? Oh, so okay. that's super, <laughs> right? It's amazing. So they wouldn't even notice the difference, right? And I mean, it was very good to do my work anyway. But uh, so I had scheduled it for the week the shoot was supposed to happen. It didn't happen that week. Of course, as happens in the real world, they didn't tell me right away. Time went on. It ended up happening the next week. Well, the next week I had a slew of interviews to do, and I knew that I absolutely had to be there, so I couldn't do it. And so they interpreted that as, oh yeah, so it was this big brand in association with maybe Coca-Cola and like McDonald's and stuff like that, huge brands, right? I want that on my resume, mm -hmm. especially when I'm just transitioning into yeah. something, so I want to be, make a big noise, right? I'm doing all these great things. Yeah, you get started with big authority. That's pretty good. Yeah. But unfortunately, because of the way the timing worked out, I couldn't actually take that job. So then I saw these people at a function months later and they said, you know, we're very surprised that you didn't actually take that opportunity, that you turned it down is what mm -hmm. they said. I was like, no, 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 no. Understand. I, I really wanted to do that, but I just couldn't get there because of my job. So that was kind of a moment where I felt like, all right, you know what? I got to just like, that that analogy that we hear all the time jump and hope that that net appears yeah so i just did that and i knew that at least by doing that like i had heard this gary vanderchuk style theories million times because that is the smart thing to do for most people exactly but i knew that i just wouldn't have that time with my current job to do that so i mm -hmm. thought i just need to create that time and so 
what I, the thought process was, I've got a job I don't necessarily want to do. There are lots of those out there. I'm going to try this thing that I really actually love doing. And if that doesn't work, I'll just get another job I don't love doing. That's exactly so it. <laughs> in my mind, that kind of mitigated that risk and mm -hmm. minimized that risk mm -hmm. for me. So I thought, I'm just going to try this thing. And if it doesn't work out and I fall flat on my face, fine. But at least... I'm going to try to do something that I actually like that gives some sort of meaning to this existence, See whatever what it is. See what life is like yeah. when you're actually... Living life. Living yeah, life. cashing them contributing in. Contributing value, you know, That's enjoying right. every day. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. Wow. That's, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of really good value in there. Yeah, for sure. Um, but again, though, I think the important thing is there are different ways to do it. There Just are. Just because that Absolutely. worked for me. Uh, doesn't mean it's going to work for other people. And the other thing, too, is that not everybody's going to want to get a night security job. And, I mean, that's yeah. fair, right? That's not going to work for everybody. Everyone's everyone's path is unique. A unique fingerprint, yeah. A, sure. It's totally unique. Um, and, and it's kind of like, you know, we could say um, it's, it's like dating. No one has the same dating history or the same dating needs. Right. Our needs change all of the time. Yeah. Um, and I think that careers are a lot like that for yeah. us. I think that we go through different parts of our lives where we need different jobs mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that we can become these mm -hmm. different people and explore these different parts mm -hmm. of lives. Um, but that, that transition, I know it's so scary for so many people. Yeah. Um, and I had that experience as well. Um, but I think for me it was just a little bit... Um, maybe more common at the time, around 2007, 2008, I was laid off from two ad agency jobs within a 12-month period. Okay. So I, I spent about six, uh, well, four months um, in between jobs, those two jobs that first summer. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then I, it was 2008 and the U.S. economy right. was failing and Canadian ad agencies were not hiring anybody. That timing. It was bad, bad timing and things, you know, it was, it was, it was a painful period. It was an incredibly painful period because I didn't know which way I was going. I didn't have any sense at all of my ability, my capability to support myself on sure. a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Like if I don't have a job that morning, how am I going to feed myself that yep. day? Am mm -hmm. I going to go to bed hungry that mm -hmm. night? Mm -hmm. And to now have come through that and have seen, you know, like, yeah, I can turn down a job anytime. Right. I don't even apply for jobs anymore. Right. Why would I ever want to apply for yeah. a job? Like, <laughs> There's a really yeah. great quote to that, which has kind of always stuck with me. I'm not even sure how to navigate it because there's, there's so many different parts to it. But the quote is basically, good is the enemy of great. I wish I could quote where I heard that from. Mm -hmm. But if you really think about that, good is the enemy of great. We can apply that to everything, to our relationships, to our jobs, to whatever it is that we're doing. And the overarching theme to that, of course, is if I get a good job that's okay, I'm probably just going to stay there. And yeah. that's going to prevent me from actually getting to what I want. The problem with that, of course, is there's a lot of downside risk that comes to that. If I just go ahead and close this door and try for door number two, I don't know what's behind there. And it may not really work out for me. So... I mean, that's the same for relationships and all this sort of stuff. So but that, how do you that is a risk. That? That's the thing is that, that people see it as a risk. Mm -hmm. See it as if I fail on trying what I'm passionate at, yeah. if I fail at, at discovering, do I actually like what I think I'm passionate right. about? Yeah. Right, <laughs> I mean, right. because you might discover, as, as I did coming out of my teenage years, I discovered I'm terrible at acting on camera. Okay. The camera does not love me. Okay. And as much as I want to become an actress, probably should find something else to do. Camera doesn't love you. I feel like we could put that to the test with somehow. <laughs> well, I, this is from when I was a teenager, okay. right? So I, I, I had no life experience. And every audition that I went on, I just wanted to be a famous actress. Sure. Right? I wanted the outcome, not the work, not the right, art. Right. I, I couldn't respect the process. And I was too young and I hadn't, didn't have the life experience yeah. at that time to understand when they weren't choosing me, it wasn't a rejection of me. Right. Yeah. And it was, it was really difficult yeah. because I wanted every job yeah. so badly. Yeah. And I would just keep on auditioning. It's okay. They didn't yeah. choose me. But yeah. 
It's hard but not when to take you those things personally. Picked, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so now as an adult, I'm like, if I wanted to go back to acting, it would be such a different right. experience. Yeah. <laughs> In yeah. my forties yeah. now, yeah. I think I would enjoy it more right. rather than looking or at it like a job. Enormous right? stress attached yeah, to it. Yeah. The, now there would be no stress. If right. I get it, if I don't, I just enjoy the process. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the approach now is it, it's not so much about the outcome. It's not so much about the paycheck or about the, you know, the good right. job kudos right. that you get. It's, a, it's really about feeling fulfilled at the end mm-hmm. of the day mm-hmm. and, and feeling like I'm progressing on a path, on a journey of my choice, yep. of my choosing. Yeah, that's an empowering thing. Of course, for sure. <laughs> the word I was, I was yeah. just like, I feel yeah. so empowered by self-employment. Yeah, yeah. So maybe the Silver Linings st- story cast is going to turn into this self-employment rock yeah, show. Right. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. I mean, I don't know that everyone is really well suited to that. Sometimes no. it's just easier to just, hey, there's this thing. I need people to do that. There are people that are just going to want to do that. But if you have a passion in you yeah. and you're going to a job every day and you're thinking, ugh. And you get home every night and you're exhausted. It's the like, opposite of empowering. Yeah, it's yeah. the opposite of empowering. It's the opposite of living because all you're doing is doing the same thing every day. Yeah. Pushing, you know, boulders slightly yeah. uphill yeah. very slowly right. until you retire. And then you're going to be too old to enjoy anything yeah. anyways. Yeah. And you won't have any life experience built up. And the important thing, I think, as well to that is that I think you had also said earlier, the experiences that we have in life are worth so much. And so the hours that we trade in for that money, we can't take any of that with us, unfortunately, but we can at least uh, that last day reflect on everything that we've done. And I think there's something healthy about something I've been thinking about recently is even thinking about that last day. And sometimes there's even a discussion about, oh, I hate Mondays. Well, if I were to die on a Tuesday, you can believe that last Monday <laughs> would be like the best day ever, right? And I would try to die, yeah, and I would sure. try to squeeze everything I could out of that. Yeah. So then, how do so I reframe not? that over yeah. every day? Every so, every day, every Monday. Yeah, why yeah, not? or every every, every day. single day. And so the idea was then I I kind of started to think about those things, and that was also one of the reasons why I decided. Look, I, I spend all these hours at a job. That's also part of my life. I yeah. sleep for a third of it, hopefully. I don't sleep that well, so it's maybe less than that. But, um, but, but that's, a, that's a big deal, right? Because I want to actually be an active participant in those hours of my life and not just trade them in. That's, it. that's exactly it. And, and I, think, I think it's really just for the people who have that gnawing mm-hmm. that, that, you know, that they want to explore. Um, uh, I know that there's a lot of people out there who are itching to yeah. try something else and to do something else. And I think my my recommendation to everyone is um, also, yes, stay with your job. <laughs> Don't quit your job until you're like until you're like me and you get laid off. The second job that I got laid off from, I smiled. Yeah. And I thank them because they handed me a big severance check at the end, too. And I was like, oh, startup money. Yay. Because <laughs> I was sick and tired of going into that job every day. And I was sick and I was like, I'm never getting the time and I never have the energy to explore what I really want. And and they, I there was no way I could quit. I have been programmed the way that I was raised by my parents. Like having a job is the most secure gift that I can give to my parents. Yeah, yeah, they right. can sleep well at night when I have an employer, yeah. when I when they know I can pay all my bills. They worry about me so much. Of course. That's their job as parents. Which is their job as parents. They're not it's not that they're undervaluing me or, or yeah. undermining yeah. my creativity or my abilities. It's their job to worry about me. And they do and it is it's such a scary thing for people, but I think you just have to start taking those those little leaps like the, yes it's a big step almost like this interview and th- there are people who are i'm interviewing for the silver lining Storycast that are in their full-time job right and and they are just starting to explore that idea of yeah. well there are people who are full-time professional speakers yeah. mm-hmm. what is that yeah. lifestyle like yeah. and they come from every background like they come from photography and they come from medical and they come from media and they come from self-employed and they're full-time 
get up on stage and speak. How yeah. the heck does that happen? Yeah. Like that is yeah. mind blowing yeah. to people. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing to see what people do. And I think that that was also empowering and that's a great message that, that we can take as well. But yeah, the, the parents thing is, is really tricky because it is mm -hmm. their job to love us and to want the best for us. But by default, they want the safest possible route for us. Mm -hmm. And that I think really is the enemy of great. And, right? and, and, and it's the safest possible route that they know from their experience. Right, right. They, they want to give us the benefit of their knowledge, of right. their life experience. Right. And so, of course, you know, my parents have never succeeded in self-employment. Yeah. So my, I have to be self-employed right. is the worst thing right. ever. Right, of course, them. of course. <laughs> my yeah. poor parents. <laughs> I mean, my parents have been very supportive, I have to say. I mean, they're, they're artist creative types, but they, they're... Amateur musicians, uh, okay. but also great artists. Like they, they draw so much better than I ever did <laughs> or ever will. They're just more natural at that. Um, but I mean, I have to say they've been very supportive, even when it was like, hey, I want to go and study music. Oh, okay, that, that's great. And we love it. And you're pretty decent at it. Uh, but they were like, okay, great. We'll, we'll do that. And then I kept studying and kept studying. Oh, that's, that's great. You got into this next program. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> Actually, are you kind of getting close to finish now? <laughs> So there, there was a little bit of that, but I mean, I have to say, I don't have the usual parents that I think put the, that kind of massive pressure on me that were willing to just trust that I was going to do, that I was going to find a way to make it work or be responsible enough to pull the plug when it was clear that it wasn't going to work. And I think that that's another one of those things as well, is that there is this whole system of those things that you're supposed to do. And I think if we really do follow that path, uh, we're going to probably be really in debt because the education that we need now is more than our parents did. That costs money as well. Um, and then if we come out of, like we're, we're not even starting at zero now once we come out, right? Because we're starting way in the negative somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And so there's that So in thing. debt at the beginning of your career. Yeah. And then so even before we get a mortgage, because that's another one of those things that we're supposed to do is buy a house and all that sort of stuff. So I mean, before we even go there, we're, we're already in debt. And I mean, I've seen friends of mine tell me, you know, I'm going to pay this off over the next 10 to 20 years. And they're like, oh my God, really? <laughs> so, I mean, then there's a lot of pressure to either I have to make this creative thing work or I've got this real debt here. So I need like a real job that's going to somehow then, cancel that out and then I'll start. That's so easy and so obvious and so alluring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think that is just definitely for most of us going to stand in our way. Yeah. Well, I think, I, I think for all of us, I think even people who are satisfied with employment, um, they're really, they, they are, they've, they've settled. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. They, yeah. they are not exploring their full potential right. if they're satisfied with their current job. Right. right. Um, they're not stretching themselves, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. Not everyone has to stretch mm -hmm. themselves all yeah. the time. And I know myself, I don't always stretch. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I go through big periods of being insecure yeah. and behaving oh, like I'm insecure. Sure, of course, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then I realize it and I'm like, oh, Debbie, just stop. You yeah. know, like, and I have a little tantrum on yeah. myself. Yeah. Like, oh, just change it. Yeah. And it's so, it's so powerful to change your thinking mm -hmm. and to, to, to have a new habit like that. Um, but I think, I think that it, this has been a really good and valuable conversation. I, I really want to thank you for the time yeah. that you've taken, Thanks for having um, me. and for sharing your stories and your insights. And, um, can you, uh, let the audience know where's the best place that they can find you or reach out to you if they have questions or want to work with you or sure. anything like that? Well, like I said, I have random strangers reaching out to me on Facebook. Yes. <laughs> so if you want to do that, you can, you can find me but there. But not for porn. Yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna. Yeah, I'm not in that <laughs> industry per se. So just to have make sure that Never. that part is clear. Um, yeah, so I'm on Facebook, Shane Gray Photography. I'm on Instagram, Shane Gray Photography. Twitter. It's too long the handle. I know you're supposed to have everything consistent, but it was SJG Photography. Right. Was the best I could do, but I Twitter haven't used really that much anyway. So <laughs> that's all good. Yeah, my website is just ShaneGray.com. Perfect. The, awkward why and with the anyway awesome so thank you very much for your time thanks for having me <laughs> thanks for listening to business innovators radio to hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today